Good evening to all of you. I welcome Right Reverend Dr. Moses Ashivadam, the Bishop of the SPG Cathedral, Mr. Das Roberts, our Chairman, and uh, I also welcome all the audience and Reverend uh, Pastor G. Timothy to this evening's program. I would like to welcome Mr. Das Roberts and invite him to please come and render the welcome speech. Good evening and welcome to this program and evening of hymns rendered by the Tabernacles supported by strong orchestra. Strong orchestra. Tabernacle does not require any introduction. They are rendering concert service through singing for the past 56 years. This may be the first concert giving importance to hymns only. The British people made our services very systematic. We follow the pattern that in worship service, we sing few hymns and few lyrics. Every song conveys love, towards mankind. Lord loves towards the mankind. So when we sing, we should understand the meaning, enjoying music alone of no use. I again repeat, enjoying the music alone is no use. But in many churches, services, when we sing, only organ music is audible. But in many churches, services, when we sing, only organ music is audible. 
no congregation voices this tabernacle program hope to improve the congregation singing with the organ so tomorrow when you are going to the church you join along with the organ in a loud voice you sing one of the famous author of hymns is francis jane crosby uh, time is 1822 1915 1822 1915 a blind woman <coughs> a blind woman in her in her 95 years 95 years she wrote 9000 hymns 9000 hymns a blind woman can you imagine a blind woman writing 9000 hymns our church uh, made one uh, on drama based on her life she never undertook a hymn without first asking the god lord good lord to be her inspiration with the above introduction i am concluding my remark thank you all thank you mr roberts i now request uh, our bishop to please come and say word let's look to the lord in prayer asking the lord to bless uh, this program for us and asking the lord to speak to us father in heaven we want to thank you and praise you for this such a, a wonderful time of uh, an evening of hymns oh god we thank you god for your presence here this evening we thank you lord for the tabernacles the gospel group musical group uh, that has been singing lord in the city and in various uh, cities of this india for uh, 56 years oh god we thank you god for the the founder late uh, kenneth v gibson we thank you for his life oh master lord we thank you god for his uh, beloved son lord uh, zubin gibson who conducts this uh, lord music uh, for us oh god we pray, O oh God, that you would bless him, his dear family, and his ministry in the church and with the tabernacles, O oh God. We thank you, O oh God, for this 56 of team members, singers, and musicians, Lord, bringing this great program for us this evening. Lord, we pray that you bless this evening for us. As we, we hear this singing, this music, we pray that you speak to us, O oh God, this evening. As Mr. Das Robert said, O oh God, it's not just to enjoy, but Lord, to understand the meaning and respond to the call, O oh Master, Lord. Father, we thank you, like, uh, we thank you, Lord, for uh, people like uh, uh, Fanny Grasby, who, Lord, uh, wrote uh, 8,000 to 9,000 hymns, O oh Master, Lord. Father, they all have written or sang with great inspiration, great, uh, Lord, dedication, commitment they have written, O oh God. Today, as we sing, as we hear, we pray, O oh God, that you speak to us this evening. We thank you, Lord, for the leadership of Tabernacle. Lord, Mr. Das Robert, Reverend George Cornelius, Mr. Vijitiopoulos, and Mr. Joseph Sunil, and all the others for God. We thank you, Lord, for uh, th this um, Millennium Methodist Church, the leadership, pastors, and the congregation members, for oh God. We thank you, oh God, for all who have come here this evening to listen to this singing. Lord, when we leave this place, we may go with the great uh, Lord resolution in our hearts, for oh God. Thank you, God. Be with us, Lord. Be with the singers. Uh, bless them. Touch all the music uh, equipment, oh, Master Lord. 
touch all the the singers who oh master and our conductor brother zubin oh god bless him oh god that we in your presence this evening that we will glorify you oh god we will sing praises unto thee oh god thank you for this opportunity we love you we thank you in jesus name we pray amen for the word of god says for the effectual and fervent prayer of a righteous avail much ladies and gentlemen monday 25th 21st august 2023 happens to be the fifth death anniversary of our founder conductor late kenneth gibson of the tabernacles who led the group for over five decades he was also a reckoned tenor solo singer of hyderabad and secunderabad who had had to his credit every valley from handel's messiah holy city and other tenor solos may his soul rest in perfect peace as a mark of respect let us stand to our feet and observe silent for 2 minutes Thank you and God bless you. You may be seated, please. The Tabernacles is an interdenominational singing group that has been serving God through their music and singing for the past 55 years. From its very humble beginning on 2nd December 1967 with a small group of 9 boys and 7 girls, the Tabernacles led by the founder conductor late kenneth v gibson is the only group in the telugu states of andhra pradesh and telangana and one among few such groups in india to have completed 56 years of rendering choral music rich christian western classical numbers and anthems continuously for so many years enchanting music lovers of our state especially the twin cities after the passing of our founder conductor late kenneth v gibson the group continues its traditional concerts every year led by our young and dynamic conductor zubin gibson please give him a round of applause gone are the days when most christian homes in the 1800s and early 1900s had a copy of the hymnal and families would not only sing hymns in their family prayers but also join in the singing at church nowadays it seems that the hymnal is being neglected in many homes churches and that people have forgotten many a meaningful and melodious hymn The Tabernacles along with the Tabernacles Chamber Orchestra therefore brings to you an evening of festival hymns with an attempt to learn relearn hymns which represent universal Christian convictions and experience and revive these lost forgotten hymns 
Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he hath done. I'm sure all of you remember the song, the lyrics and the music because it's very common to most of us. This melody and lyrics have been sung time and time again in our church gatherings. Francis Jane Crosby's hymns have historically been among the most popular songs sung by the Methodists. Crosby, born in 1820, died in 1915, who became blind as an infant, was a lifelong Methodist. She began composing hymns at the age of six, became a student at the New York Institute of the Blind at 15, and joined the faculty of the Institute at 22, teaching rhetoric and history. Her hymn texts were staples for the music of the most prominent gospel song writers of a day. In this hymn, to God be the glory, the primary focus of God's action is on the redemption of the humanity through Jesus Christ. The second line of the first stanza, so God loved the world that he gave us his son, echoes John 3.16. When you listen to the second stanza, please remember the promises of God in the second stanza refers to Christ, the perfect redemption, the purchase of blood. We should recall to mind that Jesus Christ has redeemed us by paying the ransom by his death on the cross for our sins. In the third stanza, the pronoun he is somewhat vague in its reference. Is he referring to God or to Jesus Christ? The focus is again on Christ who is our wonder, our transport and that one that we long to see in glory. So let us now welcome the choir as they render the first hymn in this evening's program and let us join in the praises to God in our hearts for all the wonderful things he has worked for us. Let us put our hands together and welcome the choir and the Tabernacles Chamber Orchestra and the conductor Zubin to give us an awesome evening. Thank you.
1 Chronicles chapter 17 verse 16 Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me thus far? While this prayer by King David teaches us a lesson of thanksgiving and humility. It is a passage that was used in a popular hymn written by John Newton. He grew up with his parents. However, his mother died when he was away at sea. Following his father's footsteps, Newton began his life's career by searching throughout the African coast for slaves to capture and eventually to sell for profit. On one journey, Newton and his crew encountered a storm that swept some of his men overboard and left others with the likelihood of drowning. With both hands fastened on the wheel of the boat, Newton cried out to God saying, Lord, have mercy on us. After 11 hours of steering, the remainder of the crew found safety with the calming of the storm. Amazing grace speaks of the sweetness found in Christ's grace for his children. As humans, we are lost, blind in sin, and need saving. Jesus' saving grace is amazing. Continuing on the second stanza, Newton writes that it was grace that taught his heart to fear the punishment of his sin. And it was also grace that those fears were relieved. The precious grace appeared when he was standing in that vicious storm. The moment he first believed. Through the trials and storms of life, it is grace that brings us through life and it is grace that would lead us to heaven. John Newton was a man that despicably sold other human beings in the slave trade. And he states in the hymn, he was wretched, but God found him. He was saved by God's amazing grace. And it was that grace that sets God's people free. When at the prodding of the Holy Spirit, we freely accept it for ourselves. The composer Newton experienced the darkness and hopelessness of his sin and the consequence of following his own corrupt ways. He focused on fulfilling what he wanted to do in his life instead of working to the direction of God. I'm sure each of us present here this evening have experienced such a situation in our lifetime and turn to God for his grace and mercy. And now, I hope you would enjoy the hymns presented by the Tabernacles and accompanied by the Tabernacles Chamber Orchestra.
thou my vision be thou my vision is the song of new life it's the song of the new life of saint patrick who shone for christ it's the song of the new life in ireland where dead paganism gave way to centuries of vibrant faith it's the song of new life in the singer's heart where god where god's forgiveness shines in a sinful soul and it is the song of new life for the hymn itself which millions now enjoy again after centuries of obscurity when saint patrick was 16 years old pirates kidnapped patrick and sold him into slavery in ireland this caused him to enter adulthood knowing the gaelic language and irish customs he also became a christian during this time years later he managed to escape and return home to his family in england while most would have stayed home forever patrick chose to go back to ireland and become a missionary what does all this have to do with be thou my vision well on one easter sunday the local irish king issued a decree in observation of a pagan druid festival that prohibited anyone from lighting a flame or candle patrick refusing to honor anyone but christ stood against the king that morning patrick risked his life by climbing to the tallest hill in the area and lighting a huge fire as the ancient irish people woke up they could all see patrick's defiance of the king he could not hide his light patrick wanted to show the world that god's light shines in darkness and that he and only he deserves praise and glory no story is done whose pages rest in the hands of the father no song is too old that it cannot be sung again in the choir of god's grace be thou my vision is a reminder that man's ways are not god's ways may he always be our vision our best thought by day and by night as the tabernacles render this hymn prayerfully let us give thanks to god for his grace and forgiveness that shines in our lives thank you
good evening though your sins be as scarlet a hymn which takes its title and thought from god's plea to israel through the prophet isaiah is though your sins be as scarlet the text was written by fanny j crosby the tune compassion or crimson was composed by william howard doan the song first appeared in 1876 in the gospel music compiled for big low and main by doan and R- robert lowry this crosby doan collaboration had not come into popular usage till it was discovered by george cole stebbins impressed with its possible usefulness he eliminated repetitions without materially changing the author's theme stebbins arrangement first appeared in 1887 intended for soprano and tenor duet Fanny Crosby was well known for her work among the missions of New York City and elsewhere that were designed to help people who were down and out to see their need of Christ she wrote songs about the need to seek the lost like rescue the perishing and songs inviting the lost to come to the Lord For example, Jesus will give you rest and Jesus is tenderly calling. As you listen to the hymn, you will observe that stanza 1, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool, makes the plea. Stanza 2, hear the voice that entreats you, O return ye unto God. He is of great compassion and of wondrous love. offers the invitation stanza 3 he'll forgive your transgressions and remember them no more look unto me ye people saith the lord your god he will forgive your transgressions and remember them no more explains the reason there is no greater message that we can tell a sinful world than that you can still be saved by the grace of god through the blood of jesus upon obedience to the gospel even though your sins be as scarlet presenting to you the tabernacles accompanied by the tabernacles chamber orchestra though your sins be as scarlet thank you
Thomas Chisholm was born in a simple log cabin in Franklin, Kentucky in 1866. Lacking a high school education or any other college training, he became a school teacher at the age of 16 and later entered the newspaper business. The following years found him ordained as a pastor, but poor health forced him to leave the ministry. After a time of recuperation, he moved to New Jersey to work as an insurance agent. A prolific writer of poetry, he sent a collection of his poems in 1923 to his good friend William Runyon, a musician associated with Chicago's Moody Bible Institute, who also worked for a hymnal publishing company. While on a trip to Baldwin, Kansas, Runyon leafed through the poems sent by Chisholm and was immediately taken in by the depth of meaning and lyrical beauty of the words found in the poem, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Out of a simple prayer, Runyon's melody took shape and the completed hymn was published by Runyon that same year. The hymn's first verse is a simple expression of God's unchanging faithfulness. Based on Lamentations 3, 22, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Verse 2 continues with an expression of God's faithfulness to us in the natural world that he created. The changing of the seasons, the movements of the celestial bodies in the sky, all joining together in praise to their creator. The hymn culminates in the final verse with the testimony of peace that comes through redemption. God's abiding presence in our daily lives and the blessed hope of heaven. The refrain echoes the infinite faithfulness of God to extend mercy and compassion. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, we present to you the Tabernacles, accompanied by the Tabernacle Chamber Orchestra. I hope their rendition of this hymn will bring comfort, peace, and joy to us all. Thank you.
I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand, reads Exodus 33:22. Did you feel the comfort that emanates from that verse? God is going to cover you with his hand. It's a very short verse in the Bible, but the sense of how much God cares for us is so immense. This verse touched the blind Fanny Crosby about whom we've been hearing for so long. The gospel song, He Hideth My Soul, was what was spent by her in 1890. William Kirkpatrick composed the music. Well, Crosby could not see with her eyes, she could see with her heart. But as it's normal for someone with an impairment, she felt insecure. Crosby did face daily insecurities in her life. However, she used her God-given talents in writing hymns and mostly emphasized on the security we have in God. She likened herself sometimes to David, living in the wilderness. She felt alone and helpless. She always supplemented her feelings and insecurities with her scripture reading and prayers. This hymn, He Hideth My Soul, was while she was reading the book of Exodus and found her inspiration in that book through Moses. As Moses asked God to show him his presence, she sought the Lord confidently. Dear people of God, no matter what your insecurities, know that he hideth you, takes your burdens away, crowns you with numberless blessings, most and the best of which remains his perfect salvation.
Look at the birds of the air, they neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Are not two sparrows sold for a coin, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your Father? But your very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. I'm sure you guessed the hymn. His Eye is on the Sparrow was written by Sevilla Durfee Martin, who was born in Nova Scotia and died in Atlanta. She describes the context out of which the hymn was born. Early in the spring of 1905, she and her husband were sojourning in Elmira, New York. They contracted a deep friendship for a couple by the name of Mr. and Mrs. Doolittle, true saints of God. Mrs. Doolittle had been bedridden for 20 years. Her husband also was, had an incurable cripple which propelled himself to business in a wheelchair. Despite their afflictions, they lived happy Christian lives, bringing inspiration and comfort to all who knew them. One day when Sivilla was visiting with her husband, Doolittle said something like this. When they were asked what brings them hope, Doolittle, Doolittle said, his eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. The beauty of this simple expression of boundless faith gripped the hearts and fired the imagination of Dr. Martin and his wife Sivilla. The hymn, his eye is on the sparrow was the outcome of that experience. The theme of solace in spite of sorrow and a profound sense of being under the watch care of Jesus, who is a constant friend, offered the African-American community comfort during the civil rights movement. Let's now listen to the tabernacles and the orchestra present. His eye is on the sparrow.
Good evening to one and all. I feel so glad to see so many of you turning up this evening. And I hope everyone is doing good by God's grace. The Tabernacles is the only choir group in the Twin Cities and one of the very few in India to achieve a milestone of 50 years. It was only possible because of the zeal and interest, the willpower and leadership qualities of the founder conductor, Mr. Late Kenneth Gibson, supported by the lots of love and attention and dedication by the singers of our group. Every year, we have our annual concert in the first Saturday of December. We are going strong with nearly 60 singers and musicians. The organization abides with this motto, service to singing. And by this motto, we have created an indelible impression in your heart and mind. This group is funded by donations and sponsors from all across the globe. And the funds are used to organize our annual concert and also some other concerts like today. During the concerts, we have offertory and the money which we get from this offertory is donated for charity every year. And so, even this day, we have the offertory. This amount will be used to make necessary arrangements for our annual concert. Our ushers will be around the place shortly to collect the offerings. We humbly request your generous offerings along with your love and support. Your sincere donations will be extremely helpful to us. Thank you and God bless you. How great thou art. Uh, I hope everybody is familiar with this beautiful hymn. But do you know that it is a Swedish hymn which has been born and it, is, uh, it began in 1886. It is written in the home of author and editor Karl Bober, a member of the Swedish parliament from 1912 to 1931. Bobek said of writing of his song, stating, it was in 1885 and in the time of the year when everything seemed to be in its richest coloring. The birds were singing in trees and wherever they could find a perch. On a particular afternoon, some friends and I had been to a chronoback where we had participated in an afternoon service. As we were returning, a thunderstorm began to appear on the horizon. We hurried to shelter. There were loud claps of thunder and the lightning flashed across the sky. Strong winds swept over the meadows and billowing fields of grains. However, the storm was soon over and the clear sky appeared with a beautiful rainbow. After reaching my home, I opened my window towards the sea. The church bells were playing the tune of a hymn. That same evening, I wrote a poem, which I titled, O Store Good, which means, How Great Thou Art. In the early 1920s, the Reverend and Mrs. Stuart K. Hine left their home in England and went to Poland as missionaries. It was there they learned the Russian version of Burbeck's song, O oh, Store Good. Hein Wen wrote original English lyrics and made his own arrangement for the Swedish melody. And so now we have How Great Thou Art.
Spafford was a successful lawyer and a businessman in Chicago with a lovely family, a wife, Anna, and five children. However, they were not strangers to tears and tragedy. Their young son died with pneumonia in 1871. In that same year, much of their business was lost in the great Chicago fire. Yet, God in his mercy and kindness allowed the business to flourish once more. On November 21, 1873, the French ocean liner Whale du Harbor was crossing the Atlantic from the US to Europe with 313 passengers on board. Among the passengers were the Spafford and their four daughters, although Mr. Spafford had planned to go with his family, he found it necessary to stay in Chicago to help solve an unexpected business problem. He told his wife he would join her, their family in Europe. Few days later, his plan was to take another ship. About four days into the crossing of Atlantic, the whale du Hava collided with powerful iron hull Scottish ship, the Loke Urn. Suddenly, all of those on board were in grave danger. Hannah, 
hurriedly brought her four children to the deck. She knelt there with Annie, Margaret Lee, Bessie and Tanita and prayed that God would spare them if that could be his will or to make them willing to endure whatever awaited them. Within approximately 12 minutes, the whale to harbor slipped beneath the dark waters of Atlantic carrying with 226 passengers, including four Spafford children. A sailor rolling a small boat over the spot where the ship went down spotted a woman floating on a piece of wreckage. It was Anna. She was alive. He pulled her into the boat and they picked up by another large vessel which nine days later landed them in Carterford, Wales. From there, she wired her husband a message which began, Saved alone, what shall I do? Mr. Spafford later framed the telegram and placed it in his office. Another of ship survivors, Pastor West, later recalled Anna, saying, God gave me four daughters. Now they have been taken from me. Someday I will understand why. Mr. Spafford booked a passage on the next available ship and left to join his grieving wife with the ship about four days out, the captain called Spafford to his cabin and told him they were over the place where the children went down. According to the Bata, Spafford Wester, a daughter born after the tragedy, Spafford wrote, It is well with my soul while on this journey.